Where, where is, there he is. How you doing, Michael? Good, Anthony. How are you? Very good, sir. Very good. Glad to uh, have you. I've been uh, wanting to talk to you for quite some time. I've seen many a documentary that you have been featured on um, and uh, always compelling, very interesting, amazing stuff. I mean, it's, uh, it's stuff that obviously many, many movies have been made and uh, people adore watching <laughs> these movies. But you, you were in it. You were right in the middle of, uh, of it back, uh, what, in the 80s, I guess? 70s, 80s, right through to, uh, I would say, mid-90s. Mid-90s. So you were, a, you were a pretty young guy when, when you first uh, got into the life there. Yeah, I was, uh, I was 21 when my dad proposed me for membership. So that's kind of the process. You get proposed, and then you go through a uh, recruit period. Um, and then you, uh, if you're, you know, fortunate or unfortunate, whatever way you want to look at it, uh, that's when you, uh, you know, you get made. And for me, it was 1975. 75. I have a, a good friend of mine here, and it's a purely coincidental. I've known this guy for many years. Uh, he, he's a former FBI agent, um, Vinny D'Agostino, and hey, he, he was involved in a, a, a few of the um, cases. <laughs> All right, so this is going to be a short interview then, right? No, no, uh, no, no, no. I can <laughs> leave. It's a goddamn stand-up comic now, for Christ's sake. Yeah. No, I'm only, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Good to see nice you again. Nice to meet you. Yep. <clears throat> you, so you one got of my, uh, just so you know, one of my dearest friends now, who um, fortunately we only met once in my former life, is uh, Joe Pistone. Oh, Donnie okay. Brassett. Yeah. Did, did you meet him as Joe? Or is Donnie? <laughs> no, I met him as, as Donnie first. Um, he came down to my auto dealership with another guy that he was with at the time. And, uh, you know, we had a conversation, but that was it. Fortunately, he was with a, another family he was involved in. It wasn't mine, so didn't get involved with him. Uh, so, so, but you were still in the life when uh, that story broke and it, uh, everyone knew that he was an agent? Oh, yeah. How did that affect, uh, I mean, everybody in, in, the, uh, in the life? Well, it was scary, you know, because he was around for so long undetected. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, he spent six years, I think, undercover, and he, you know, he met a lot of guys, and he was, uh, you know, they were going to make him. I mean, oh. he, was, he was that close. And uh, so when we found out, you know, listen, you know, we know other guys that were around for 20 years, but they weren't undercover agents. They were just informants working with the government. But yeah. when you hear that, that, uh, you know, an undercover agent can stay undercover that long and oh. be that involved, it's, it's kind of scary. Now, I know with uh, all the paranoia, uh, after that was, was that story was broke, uh, how, many, how many guys must have, you know, because someone goes, hey, we're just not, kind of, uh, not, not quite sure about this, uh, paid with their lives because, uh, you know, that guy did fit in so well and, and, and lasted so long undercover. Well, you know, I'm not saying anything out of turn because it's public knowledge, but uh, Sonny Black, who was the captain at that time, he sure. was, uh, you know, Lefty Gunn's captain. Uh, he paid with his life. He got killed over it. Lefty was going to get killed, but um, from what I understand, the FBI interceded on a meeting that he was going to that would have been his last meeting, and mm -hmm. they saved him. Uh, you know, he died of natural causes later on, but, Cancer you know, I think that was the only, the only <laughs> one that died as a result of that, but uh, a lot of guys went to jail. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess, you know, uh, honestly, that and, and you were in it up to that point in the 90s where it really started to turn. There wasn't this loyalty anymore. You had people like uh, in the in the 70s, even in the 80s, Giuliani, who was really cracking down on organized crime uh, in New York. Uh, it, it got pretty difficult. Do you think do you think there's still uh a level of organized crime that exists now that was at at the level it was back in the, in those days? Well, there's no question that it still exists. Sure. I mean, you know, it's it's not going to go away in my lifetime. I don't believe so. But it's not it's not what it was during my time and before my time. Obviously, you know, you got to give Giuliani the credit or the blame again, depending upon which side you're on. But <laughs> yeah, he. Uh, he really used the racketeering laws effectively. And, you know, and they came out with the RICO statute and the Bail Reform Act and the Sentencing Reform Act. They started to turn a lot of guys and you know, sentences were becoming very extreme. And, you know, the RICO statute also had big forfeiture clauses around it. So, uh, look, he put all the bosses away in the commission case. 
yeah. I was one of the first uh, indictments under the RICO statute at that time. Fortunately, I was acquitted um, in Giuliani's case, or I wouldn't be here today. But uh, I wouldn't be free today. But uh, he, he put a lot of guys away. He, he really hurt the life in a big way, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it, it really did change uh, the course of uh, organized crime in, in New York, especially, which, of course, was kind of the pinnacle of, uh, of the whole thing. You did get indicted. You did get tried and you did go to prison for a while. What, uh, what they, I know they got you on Rico. They got you on that gasoline thing, which is just, I can't get enough information. I can't I watch, going on now with watch the gas enough prices. show. Yeah. The gas prices. Michael, what are your thoughts? Is there someone else pulling a tax scam on the gas at $4 a gallon? I'll tell you what, people would love me because I'd be stealing all the tax and lowering the price of the pumps. So uh, they would love me for that, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll tell you what, it's payback every time till I go to a gas station. Right <laughs> yeah, yeah look at that. It's your little bit of karma every time you fill out. Well, the taxes have doubled and tripled. I mean, in California oh. alone, the, the state sales tax is 72 cents a gallon. Wow. You know, just the state tax. The, the uh, federal tax is another 18 cents, so... You know, you got you got close to a buck. At, but during my time, it was twenty five to thirty cents. You know, mm -hmm. so oh I would have done God. I would have done as much as I did in half the time. Let's put it that the, way. The, the government's <laughs> the biggest La Cosa Nostra out there, Michael. So it's okay. You can say it. <laughs> no doubt about it. Hey, that's that's my next book, A Mafia Democracy, and uh, uh, I'm going to nail them. I'm telling you right now. And now, I got a different perspective. I see the government for what it really is. I think we all do and, now. Yeah, they're going to hear about it. I think we all do now. You so you're this you're this young kid. You 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 get in. Uh, obviously, you know your dad. You get in because of your dad. It's kind of a nepotism uh, business. And then you come up with this idea. Now, how the hell did you figure out how to get? From what I read, something like nine cents a gallon off of uh, off of every gallon that was pretty much sold in New York. <laughs> How did well, you? That, that was just the federal tax. The federal tax was nine cents a gallon. The city, state, and local oh was God. another 25 to 30 cents. And why not take it all? Work. Why just do federal or state and get, why not make sure you can get every bit of it, you guys? Well, you know, listen, you know, I always I always reason this way. You get as much time for doing, you know, for stealing a hundred thousand as you do for stealing a million. So you may as well go for it. I mean, there's no different. <laughs> I love it. Holy but, shit. Uh, where now the idea, where does it come from? I, I really want to know the um the first inkling. Like you're sitting there watching ding ding, you're watching the gas pump go. How do you look and go, I think I could get that tax money? <laughs> Well, here's the thing. I can't claim the credit for that because it was a guy in the business that came to me. He had a, a small operation on Long Island and some guys from another family were extorting him for money. So he ran to me for help. And he said to me, Mike, I have a germ of an idea where we can possibly take, you know, gas, the tax money from uh, every, every gallon of gasoline. And he said, but I really need your help to do it. So he kind of explained it to me. And I said, look, I'm going to give this a shot. So I, I got rid of the other two guys that were bothering him. And I, uh, I said, let's, let's give it a try. So I put <laughs> I somebody that. with me. And that when I say vague. get rid of them, I mean, I made them go away. You made clear. them go away, not get rid yeah. of them. No, you know, they, they backed off, I should okay. say. Okay, all right. Terminology. A little conversation. But I put some guy to work with him. We started a new company and we got new offices because I didn't want to intermingle his old stuff. And uh, I had a guy around me named Vinny the Butcher. He was my butcher. He was a big guy, big scar across his head, scary looking guy, right? And I said, Vinny, I want you to stay with this guy, Larry, and let's see what we really have. After about a week and a half, Vinny comes to my house in Long Island a Saturday morning, and he's got a box on his shoulder, right? And I used to bring me meat on a Saturday. So he comes to the door, and I said, what are you doing with that box? Are we having a party or something I don't know about? What's with all this meat? He said to me, hey, Chief, it ain't meat. Oh. Come into the kitchen. So we go in the kitchen, he puts it down on the table, he opens it up, and he said, this is the first week's take in the gas business. It was $320,000. Oh, first <laughs> first week. week. Well, he got my attention, right? So from that point, you know, over the next seven, eight years, we ran that 320 into eight to $10 million a week. A week. A week. Eight to 10 million a week in the 70s or 80s? Yeah. It, was, it was late 70s and then into the early 80s, mid 80s, yeah. Now, I was just talking to Vinny earlier about this. Um, you got to know, while you're doing it, 
And while that money's rolling in, you got to say to yourself, no one ever gets away with this. At some point. It's the spending it that's a problem. So, like, whether it was organized crime or cyber, we were talking about this on the big uh, $4 billion, $4.5 billion, uh, the, two, the couple that got arrested, right? It's the, the getting it's part one. It's the spending of it. That's part two. That's becoming more and more difficult. That's the so, problem. Having you know, to your 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 um your dad. You know, uh, nobody would guess. So so um yeah. I was I was on the Colombo squad for for uh, about eight years. So mm-hmm. I probably I don't know recorded your dad about a hundred times on Jeez. on on tape. Um, and I spent a lot of time with John uh, after after uh, he was taken off the street. So my uh, brother. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I was when he was in Whitsec, I was I was the one prepping him from trial and that was after uh Lewicki and them had retired. Um and uh and so By the way, Lewicki's become a friend also. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that How could something? you not like his big teeth? Yeah. Um, I thought he was a little bit sunburned in the Newsday documentary we did, but uh <laughs> but uh Well but, that's right. Now that's where I recognize you from. Right, correct. Yeah, yes, yeah. Okay. You prick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was the one who made the tape with your dad with the with the uh, garbage disposal and the acid. You it's know, like- I, I got to tell you something. It was so disappointing because thanks to my dad, you know, I never really, I never got caught on tape with anything that could hurt me. There was, you probably know there was that undercover investigation on me with, it was called shadow boxing. Yeah, I know a little uh, bit about it. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, it was like the first thing I read when I got to the FBI. But yeah, yeah, All right. yeah. And they had they had about 83 tapes on me, but nothing yeah. that was able, ever able to be used. And even yeah. that agent I became friendly with la- later on. But yeah, but um, he always taught me, you know, always to be careful who I speak to, you know, never get on the phones and say anything wrong. And I did my best. And then as it turns out, he was the one that, you know, made the mistakes on, on and it was getting old, you know, I understand well, that. Was, that. Yeah, I wanted to ask your opinion on that because there was definitely, um, there was definitely a part of him that I think, uh, so when John started wearing the wire and I think when John disappeared, he was just kind of in a really vulnerable spot. And yeah. so we had a very well positioned source that served, that was in prison with him and he, um, he had connected with right before that had happened. So I think there was a lot of things that, again, in my, in my, my humble opinion, I thought there was, you know, as you might remember from the documentary, and I, I meant this, that there were many times when I'd get my recording devices back and just sit there and listen to these tapes of, of your father speaking, just because historically I, it blew me away. It was, it just blew me away. I'm, I'm first generation Italian. So for me to hear that stuff firsthand was amazing. But there were a lot of things that I felt like your dad was trying to impart on um, my source that wouldn't have happened, you know, had there been someone else there for him to do that, you know, like, yeah, like John, he, yeah, like know, John, he, I think that, 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 that hurt him a lot. And, you know, and I think at his advanced age, you know, he was kind of in a spot where he was, he was, he was still careful. Don't get me wrong. He wasn't like sitting down at yogurt and such saying, this is the plan of what we're going to do with this, you know, extortion. It wasn't like that at all, but he certainly was, um, was someone who, who enjoyed the company of, of my source. And, mm. you know, when you're in the car for four hours, those stories come out. And I think that's, like you said, that's kind of unfortunate. Plus, you know, you're talking about recording devices that, you know, Joe Pistone wearing a Nagra, you know, the size of a boom box, uh, on his yeah. waist or his leg and what we were using, like no offense, but your dad, I mean, was, there was no match for it. Like, you know, something so tiny, that's so insignificant. But the reason I mentioned was your dad, you know, I remember taking those, um, surveillance photos and you would never guess who your dad was based on how he was conservative with spending money, like the car he drove, you know, um, you just would have never guessed that. And, mm. and that was something that, I'd be sitting there with looking at your dad pulling up to something in a very humble, beat up. Uh, I think he had that maroon Buick or whatever it was. Yeah. And then somebody, especially the Albanians, pulling up in like a two hundred fifty thousand dollar Bentley, yeah. and you would think he was the the former underboss, and your dad was a nobody, and it was completely backwards. You know, and that's yeah. just a that's well. Isn't that how? Isn't that how things were supposed to be? And that's how. Uh, especially the old school guys wanted it. When you got some flamboyant people, especially, I mean, the the one we all think about is John Gotti, where he's wearing, uh, you know, the rings and the suits yeah. and uh, kind of playing to the press. Uh, 
you know, your father was an old school guy. He he, he knew how to work uh, the business uh, the way they had done it for many years. Yeah, I mean, my dad in the in the '60s would drive a uh, a red Plymouth Valiant, you know, a '62 red. My mother used to get upset with him, and then we bought he bought a, a white Chevy Impala. He just didn't want to be ostentatious. Yeah. When he came home from prison uh, on one of his five violations, I bought him a new Mercedes. And he was like, I said, Dad, just drive it. It's okay. I bought it for you. It's all right. You know, we can afford it. It's in my mother's so he name. Drove it. it was almost reluctant that he drove it, but he liked it. Now, when you got uh, when you got arrested and put on trial, uh, were you were you scared for your life at that point? I mean, uh, especially at that time where there wasn't much trust that people were going to uh, clam up. Um, were, were you worried? Well, you know, I, I, I went to trial five times, you yeah. know, four times in the state and then once on the Giuliani case. You know, um, listen, you're always concerned. I'm, I'll tell you, what, one of the most stressful things you could ever face is when you're standing in front of a jury and they're about to render their verdict. And you know that if you want to hear one word, that one word is not. Yeah. That's the one word <laughs> yeah you want anything to hear. after that don't matter. That's it. Anything, uh, you know, just that one word is not. <laughs> not. Especially when you know, if you don't hear that, you're going away for a long time. Yeah. So I was fortunate in that I was never convicted at trial. I was either acquitted or uh, dismissed or, you know, uh, I had three hung juries on one case. But um, what happened, I was convinced on the, on the gasoline case, I took a plea. Yeah. And, and the reason I did that. I probably could have went to trial. I might have beat it because the major witness against me in the Giuliani case would have been the major witness on the gas case. And we destroyed him in the Giuliani case. I mean, mm -hmm. they almost threw him out of the program. It was that bad from what I understand, at least. But uh, I just knew it was never going to end. At one point in time, I was going to go down. And, and once I did go down, for every case I won, yeah. I'd get that much more time and I'd be <laughs> right. away forever. So... I just wanted to cut my losses. I was fortunate I had leverage because I know they really wanted to convict me in the Giuliani case. And when I beat it, they indicted me only a couple of months later. And being that that same witness was testifying, I knew I had leverage. And that's when we started to negotiate. Make a deal. Yeah. Oh, where'd you go? We're losing the connection. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Good? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, back. you're back. So, yeah. So, obviously, you have some leverage. You can make a deal. And uh, what what was that deal? How how much t time did you? I got a ten year sentence and a uh, I think uh, fourteen point seven million dollar restitution and and forfeiture. So you know I gave him some assets and uh, I did you know close easy to come easy go. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Huh? Easy come easy go, right? You yeah. don't even get to enjoy uh, it. That's brutal. <laughs> Holy shit! That's a lot of money. You, did, you, whole, did you did you pay it? <laughs> You know what? I paid it and a lot more. Now, you may not know this, but here's the thing that happened. When the witness against me on the Giuliani case, when I got uh, acquitted, he was my partner in the gas business, the guy I was describing earlier. Uh -huh. We had a fund in uh, Austria. We had $33 million in an Austrian bank. <clears throat> he had half of the uh, number and I had half wow. the number. It was a number to count. And when he was testifying against me, I was telling his son, Tell him, do his thing. I'll fight him in court, but don't give up the money. Right. Tell him money. We'll split it up no matter what. Well, after he lost that case, he got so desperate, he gave them, told them there was money in Austria. Uh. So from what I understand, and again, I'm getting this secondhand, uh, the feds went to Austria. They tried to get the money, but uh, the Austrian bank wouldn't give it to them unless they had the entire account. Uh -huh. So as part of my plea, I gave up that number oh. and they got that money, but I was never credited with any of it. And it was $33 million in that account. So wow. what happened with it? I have no idea. Uh, we all got new Buick cars. Yeah. <laughs> new <Buick> cars. Guns. <laughs> that same year, they upgraded our equipment. Yeah. Uh, Saudi's training to fly. Yeah, they seized planes. it. So we've like we seized. Like I mean, I can't. T I don't remember that specifically. Um, the, the the bank account issue, but generally, like you said, civil civil asset forfeiture is a huge hammer. And so you know, we would seize cars and social clubs. Oh and, yeah. You know, it gets auctioned off, and then the money goes back to the treasury, and then they spend four thousand dollars to figure fix a pothole so it's all wasted anyway yeah. um, but that's generally what happens to Christ. it right so you, well, you now now when you get out uh and and start 
you know, talking. You're you're, you're pretty public uh, about what had happened and the life and uh, writing books and everything. Again, uh, anyone that's, you know, and, and look, most of the people get their information from amazing movies we've watched over the course of the years. So you would think, uh-oh, Michael's fucked. You know, somebody's going to come after him for uh, for mouthing off. How does that work? How, and, and if it is the case, why would you do it? And if it isn't the case, why isn't everybody uh, doing it? Well, here's the thing. I mean, every everybody's situation is different. You know, um, I was talking to the feds afterwards because I wanted to make them understand I was out of the life. And Ed McDonald was the prosecutor at the time. He was the uh, former head of the strike force in private practice now. But um, I kind of played a game with the government. I was giving them information, but I always told my father and I sent word back to Persico, I'm not going to put anybody in prison and I'm not going to testify against any of our guys. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I testified in one case against Norby Walters, who was an associate of mine, whose life I saved three times. I mean, they wanted to kill this guy because he kept using our name, never paying up. And I saved him. So I knew nobody would care if I testified in the Walters case. And, um, and after that, I said, I'm not going to hurt anybody. So quite honestly, I was playing a game with the government. I, I, I made a deal where they had to get information out of me for one year. And if they couldn't prosecute anybody in one year, that was tough luck. And, uh, and they couldn't. And I skated at that point. So, you know, Persico, those guys, they knew I wasn't putting anybody in prison. I could have put a lot of guys away. I could have hurt a lot of people if I really went all the way on it. And then, quite honestly, these guys had their own troubles. Uh -huh. Everybody was in trouble during that time. Who was going to jail? Sure. Who was getting killed? We had a war in our family from 91 to 94. You know, you know that, you know, the Colombo, I mean, the uh, uh, Persico Arena, Arena War. Yeah. So, you know, I wasn't that important. Now, mm. don't get me wrong. I couldn't go back to Brooklyn and say, hey, guys, want to come back into the neighborhood? <laughs> no shit. You, yeah, I don't I mean, know. I, you might be I, surprised. Everyone's got a, uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know if they'd hold the grudge anymore, to be honest. Open arms, well, you know huh? what? So many guys have reached out to me since then. Uh -huh. I, I really mean that. It's a that. different world. You know, in different ways. And uh, wow, John, know, John, look, John, I, I knew I knew the life was over, and, and you know I had such a bullseye on my back. Eventually, I was going down. It was wow. crazy. crazy. It's like, uh, you know, I've seen plenty of documentaries where they get these old uh, World War II German pilots and American pilots that literally fought each other, yeah. trying to kill each other. And they're shaking hands and telling yeah. stories. You know, I guess enough time goes by. And, and I think there's probably a mutual respect and understanding for what each other mm -hmm. did. Yeah. Um, you know, well, they could, everyone could say what they want. Like Michael, you just said it best, right? Everyone's circumstance is different. And we had guys that we would look to cooperate that, you know, year one would, were 0% chance. And the situation builds up and the circumstances build up that year, t year 10, they're begging to cooperate. Yeah. And so th that's just the weight and the pressure. People don't want to, the, 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 you know, the, the John had his own reasons, you know, uh, as he testified, at trial about why he did what he did. My my source uh, had his own reasons. He didn't want to go back to jail. He already did, I don't know, 10 years or something. He had kids now. He didn't have kids before. Now he's got kids and he's looking at 20 to so life. So there's a difference um, in his you life. You name it. Uh, to, yeah. You know, you name it. Out of the guys that we, we cooperated, every single one of them um, uh, had a reason that in their mind – was more important than protecting the other people they were around. Yeah. Well, that's right or wrong. That's that's yeah. It's just the way it is. The way it is. Mike, what do you think yeah. about uh, this? Uh, look, America. We have a fascination with organized crime. I mean, they're the most popular movies. We love the the characters, whether they're fictional or real life. We love hearing the stories. And from someone who you know was in it, uh, how do you see that? people's fascination and almost adoration with the uh, the life you know look i i've been speaking now for 25 years all around the world all around the world and no matter where i go i mean we have you know standing room only crowds yeah. and you know when i first started speaking and i would go into the midwest nobody really knew who i was i mean you know i i had high profile in new york maybe but um, and they used to just put on the marquee, the mob guy <laughs> and standing room only. Yeah, they just yeah. wanted to hear the story. So what is it? Look, it's the media, it's, it's entertainment industry. 
They've glamorized it in such a way. And it's the money, the power. Look, I speak to a lot of young kids, a lot of these gangbangers. I go into, you know, detention centers all the time, juvenile halls. And they'll say the same thing. Oh, Michael, you guys had all the money, all the power. I saw good fellows. I saw this. I saw that. And I say, yeah, that's true. But did you watch the end of the movie? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. You know, they yeah. don't see the end of the movie. Yeah. I said, who got killed? Who went to jail? Who lost? The How come you don't see that part? And they don't. <laughs> they honestly don't. They're yeah. fascinated with money, power, women, cars, girls, the whole bit. And, uh, and look, the, I mean, look, a hundred years later, a hundred years later, you know, I, I'm, I'm in a, in a market and uh, uh, there's a magazine with Al Capone on the cover. And the entire magazine is about Al Capone. Yeah. A hundred years later after his, his death. So there's a fascination that's not going away and yeah. uh, not the way I see it. Listen, I'm in Singapore. I'm in front of 1,800 people. I do my thing. My host comes in. He says, look, uh, we promised a Q&A for them. So, but Singaporeans don't ask questions. They're very polite. We'll put a shill in there, ask one or two. That was it. I said, great, we'll go home early. When I tell you I was there for two hours. <laughs> they were asking questions. John Gotti, where was Jimmy Hoffa buried? I mean, <laughs> everything that you could imagine. They were so knowledgeable about it. It was unreal. And where does that come from? It's the yeah. media. Yeah. Also, though, you, you talk about like people that that aren't in it that watch it, that hear about it, uh, that the media uh, puts it in front of our faces. Yeah. You don't think about how the movie ends, but you were in it, not thinking about how the movie ends. Like you, it must've been an amazing time to have a, a scam going on where so much money's pouring in. You got everything you want. You got the respect of, of uh, the family because you're bringing so much money in. Uh, at any time, did you think about, you know, the proverbial end of the movie? Honestly, um, no. Yeah, because it's I mean, got to be amazing know, at the time. I was so used to being a target, you know. I mean, I grew up with a target, so it just it came on me. We had the name, but, you know, when you're rolling like that, and especially you have some yep. success beating, and I had all the money I needed to defend myself. Yeah. And, you know, I watched my father get railroaded in a case, because I'll tell you this, I don't care what anybody says. My father obviously did what he did in his life. But that particular case that uh, he did all that time on, he was he was framed. My father was no bank robber. I I, I believe that we investigated that case. We did everything. But but and, and that prepared me that I was going to fight hard. I had the money. I had the you know I had everything at my disposal, and I was as careful as I could be. But even then. It, it hit me after the Giuliani case. I yeah. said, well, really, it's only a matter of time. I'm going to go down. And that's when I started to, you know, try to cut my losses. Did you, did you ever feel uh, early on when you were a kid? Um, first of all, as a, to kind of preface this question, when did you know what your, your family was into? Well, I, I mean, at an early age, because my dad had so much publicity, you uh -huh. know, when I was a kid. Did, so he, he, try to, did he try to excuse, did he try to say, nah, this is horse shit or, you know, well, I do this, but not this. Did he try to cover it up or was it just like, yeah, this is me. This is what we do. Anthony never talked about it, uh -huh. never brought it into the house. You know, back and, and you know, you, you'll understand this. Back in my day, you know, the FBI and all the local uh, agencies would have a car parked around our house 24 hours a day, seven yeah. days a week. We were under constant surveillance. So every time we leave, we had a parade of law enforcement vehicles following us. So, and he never talked about it. The only thing my dad ever told me, and, you know, I don't want to be offensive to anyone. He told me, Michael, I don't ever want you to be in law enforcement. Uh -huh. said, because law enforcement officers take an oath to arrest their own fathers and mothers. Wow. And how could you ever do something like That's that? That's okay, because my dad said to me, I don't on. want you to ever be in the mafia. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, guess, I guess it's a wash. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Holy so he, put it, he put that in my head early on. I mean, he, he made me dislike law enforcement intensely uh, from, a, from the time I was a kid. So, Mike, I want to ask you about that, not to cut you off. I want to ask you about that, right? Because you're first generation as well, right? Yeah. Um, so my, my parents, my parents uh, both from Italy, met, met here in Brooklyn, uh, immigrated here in, in the 70s. And part of the reason they left Brooklyn for Long Island, bumblefuck Eastern Long Island, was the, the presence of organized crime and the idea that they wanted something better for their kids, right? 
And mm -hmm. again, not a pot to piss in when they came here, right? Poor as shit, living, living with family in Brooklyn. My dad was delivering ice and coal for a while, then went to the army, became uh, uh, trained in electrical engineering, blah, blah, blah. In one generation, right, raised uh, me, right, not to, not to whatever. I went to law school. I went to the FBI. I started helped start a company now and, and uh, doing stand-up because, of course, that's natural. Uh, and my brother became a neurosurgeon in one generation, right? Now, how do you, how do you feel like you even stood a shot? with your dad being who he was and John, like, did you even stand the chance? I don't, I don't think so. Um, <sighs> when I look back and if you talk, you probably had, you know, lengthy conversations with my brother, but my brother, you know, he believes we never had a shot in any, he doesn't understand how I got out and survived the way I did, yep. you know? Uh, and by the way, my brother and I have reunited over the Good. past couple of years. I was going to ask yeah. you that. Good. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you know, look, I love my brother. And I was, I was upset with him. Sure. I was angry with him for what he did. But in a way, I understand. I really do. And we've really, you know, he's back with the family now. And it's, it's, it's joyous to have him, have him with me. But um, yeah, I know watching I him. Know we, I don't think we ever had a shot, honestly. I don't think so either. And I did talk to your brother about this. And I remember at the trial, you probably don't remember because I had hair. Um, and, and this, this was, uh, I know you came in a few times. Um, and... I know, you know, watching your brother testify, I couldn't imagine it. I was, I was uncomfortable. Oh my God, you know, right? I helped prep him, prep him for that. Uh, but he was nervous as shit, you know, doing that. And I couldn't imagine seeing that. And I could sell, tell how angry you were. And I always wonder just because, um, as you said, people do things because, you know, the situation they're in and, and it sort of leads them to this conclusion that this is the right thing. And it's kind of hard sometimes to judge people as to whether it's right or wrong. I get the idea that here he is testifying, but as he said, he never really looked at it as testifying against your dad. He looked at it as testifying against the life. And mm -hmm. now as a father, I don't know if you have kids or not, right? I have, I have kids. Like I kind of look at it from that, that perspective now of like, what would I, what, a, what I would be mad about that, but I would also be mad that my father you know, sort of introduced me into this, that I really didn't stand the chance to go in another direction. Mm. You could have been a neurosurgeon, right? You know, yeah. you could have been a lawyer, right? And so I, I don't know, it's not to blame because your dad had his own situation that he grew up into, that he was just dealing with the cards that he was dealt. But I think about that a lot. I don't know if that ever crosses your mind. It does, you know, and I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, and by the way, I have seven kids and six grandkids. Oh, yeah. but, um, God bless. You know, the one... The one thing I always loved my dad, regardless of anything, obviously we had a difference of opinion in the later part of, of our lives. But um, one thing that I was upset with him over, I went, after my mother passed away in 2012, I went to see him. He was in prison and he was, um, you know, obviously a bit depressed, which is unusual. I never seen him depressed. But, you know, I, I was talking to him and I said, you know, dad, you got to take some responsibility because he was kind of blaming my mom for a lot of things. And I said, you got to take responsibility for what happened in our family. Our family has mm. been destroyed. Wow. Yeah. And he looked at me and he said, it's not my fault. He said, I was framed on this case. If I wasn't framed, none of this would have happened. And I said, dad, yeah. I said, stop. Yeah. I said, you weren't framed because you were a doctor, a lawyer, or a priest. <laughs> you're framed because you're, you're a criminal like me. This is yeah. why we have this tag on our backs. And he could never accept it. He got a little upset with me. He said, no, you're wrong. I said, I'm not wrong, Dad. I said, you got to take responsibility. Our family's been destroyed, and we caused it. And, uh, and he never would come to terms with that, not, at yeah. least not with me. I mean, maybe he did with himself, but he wouldn't admit it to me. And so, that was troubling because we were talking about, you know, even after we were talking about John, and I said, you know, look, the kid was a mess. He was a mess, Dad, and he was a mess because of our lifestyle. Yeah. Mm. It's so um, – they, they kind of portray that in a lot of movies where the, the father figure is, is trying so hard to, to do good for the family and literally loses the family yeah. because of that. I mean it's the godfather. It's uh, Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad's a great it's, example. It's a great example of that. And, and it seems like that's something that they really did get a big dose of reality – uh, when they put that in, in movies, this this uh, image of family when it comes to organized crime is so different than what the average person thinks yeah. of family. I love my family. I love my brother, my sister. But, uh, but I can't imagine doing anything 
that would lead to their incarceration, God forbid, death. Yep. Uh, and, and this image of organized crimes version of family is something so different and twisted uh, that I don't know. I, I don't get it. <laughs> I just well, don't I'll tell get you it. this. My, my oldest boy, John, was living in New York. He's out here with me now. But um, and I had spoken to him when my father was around. This is several years ago. And I said, what have you been doing? He said, well, I've been driving grandpa here and I've been taking grandpa there and I've been this and that and that. And it got me a little bit concerned. Uh -huh. And I flew into New York and I sat with my dad and I said, dad, <laughs> you need to stop this. And he said, what do you mean? I said, I want my son involved in this in any way, shape or form. And he was, oh, Michael, you don't want to. I said, no, 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 dad, that's it. I said, yeah. I will chain him to the basement. Yep, I'll pull exactly. Him to California. I said, he's not getting involved. And uh, I said, yeah, I need you to respect that. And he did after that. He said, OK. He said, you feel that strongly about it? I said, 100 percent. Do you I worry? Said, First of all, if people are mad at me and you're gone, I said, what are you going to do? Get my son killed? Oh, my God. You know, God. and I really put that in his head. And uh, and that was the end of that. And then I pulled my son out to California. I said, I'm not taking any chances. You're coming you're, out you're, here. Your dad was so, not to cut you off, Andrew. Oh, go ahead. Today, but your dad was so, um, so focused on that life, like, you know, there, there was never a time on a single recording, single instance where your dad wavered from that and was showing like being two faced. Like your dad never said one thing and then behind closed doors said, I don't really believe in that. Your dad was so singularly focused on that lifestyle that huh. I don't think there was anything or anybody that he wouldn't bring into it. Not because he felt like it was, it was hurting them. It was like, he was teaching them to speak English. Like it was just, a, a, that was what you wow. do. You teach your kids to speak English. And I think, you know, you're talking about your son and all that. Again, I don't think it comes from a place of malice. I just think he was so oh. singularly focused on that. He was just, that was his entire life. That's why I think I said him in the documentary, he was absolutely a last of a dying breed because when we talked about approaching your dad to cooperate him, I was like, I'm not, doing i'm not participating that's a waste of time as a, a waste of time a waste of gas i said there's there's one person i'm confident of and i've cooperated some pretty impressive people in the past that i will never be able to cooperate and it was your dad because i understood yeah. that he was he was true true blue for for uh uh, uh for that lifestyle that wasn't a, that wasn't an act for him no you're 100 right but i will tell you this so i'll give you a little bit of insight number one my dad's legacy was more important to him than anything. And the legacy of never uh, cooperating yep. uh -huh. was everything to him. That's number one. But number two, privately, because he and I, had, my father's dream was for me to take over as boss of the family at some point in time. And he used to tell me, bide your time, bide your time. And, you know, when we had our private talks and privately, he would tell me, Mike, this life is full of SHIT. He says, understand that. Somebody's telling you this, don't believe it. He would, he would give me that insight, and he taught me very well. I mean, he, he taught me how to be a student of that life very, very well. But he knew the reality of it, believe me. Mm. He, he understood it better than anybody. He knew the reality, but he oh, would never is, come out and say it publicly or to anybody else outside of, I guess I was his inner circle at that point in time, and, and that, uh -huh. that was it. Because, you know, that's the truth. I mean, look, I had a lot of regard for the life and a lot of respect for the life, but there was a lot of backstab. Look, you know, sure. you've spoken yeah. to people. There's a lot of stuff that shouldn't have been going on that did go on. Yeah, well, there, there, absolutely. I mean, the whole basis of it, like we would, you know, uh, I mean, I could, I'll, I'll send you an email after the show, but, you know, in terms of the names of the people and how the cooperation happened and, and you know, uh, when that stuff would turn and those people would decide to cooperate, they, people think it's the movies where you're going to go in and confess to shoplifting. Like, no, you know, you're going to spend a hundred hours with me telling me every single awful thing you did from 15 and up. <laughs> Literally, like, you know, from the car stereos you stole to your first homicide to to uh, every robbery you did. Because we know that if Michael's standing on the other side, he's telling his defense attorney every single awful thing you did. Even if he was with you with half of them, he's going to say he wasn't. And you're going to be cross-examined on that. So it's not, yeah, it's not an easy yeah. experience. I'm telling you, Mike, you might be surprised at how many people, you know, 
crying during, you know, these sessions, you know, I'm like, Jesus Christ, I'm like becoming this guy's shrink, you know, <laughs> it, it, you know, here's this guy's murdered eight people and, and he's, I'm, he's on my shoulder crying. I'm like, That's you know, this is just bizarre, but Jesus Christ, do you, do you worry about your family uh, in, in that? I don't know. You'd have to think not, not genetically, but almost a predestined fate. Did you worry that your kids would would you know would would continue even if you you put it in them that you don't want them to you raise them right that something something is in this this family that predestines you to to being in the life well i mean my youngest boy michael junior no he he just doesn't have it in him you know he's not that kid uh my oldest boy john i, I saw some of that in him like uh-huh. he used to tell me that if you got any money buried, you know, tell me I'm single. I'll do a couple of years in prison. You'll live good after. From the Bohack just, heist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just say, go, go to work, you know, stop that nonsense. But, but no, I never worried about that because I, I wouldn't let it happen no matter yeah. what. I would not let it happen. I would committed uh, whatever I had to do. I wouldn't let it happen. So I wasn't worried about that at all. But I'll tell you this, you know, in response to that, after I took a plea, I had a, a racketeering case in Florida also, gas-related. So I took a plea um, with the feds first. And then, you know, because they, they don't run the feds concurrent with the state, but they'll run the state concurrent with the feds. So mm-hmm. I'm on a plane. I'm in custody. We go to Florida. I take the plea down there. I get nine years concurrent with the 10. On the way back, you'll appreciate this. I was talking to all the agents, and they were saying, Mike, now that it's over, tell us the truth. When we were watching you here, was this really happening? And they were asking me all these questions. <laughs> so I was teasing them. I said, yeah. you know what, guys? I said, I was getting tired of beating you. I beat you five times. I figured I'd give you one win. Right? Yeah. I'd give you one win. I said, I probably would have beat this case, too. <laughs> I'll never forget. One of the agents looked at me, and he looked at me, and he said, Mike, not this time. He says, you became a superstar, and they were lining up to testify against oh, you. Oh, shit. He put that in my head. And yeah. I never forgot that, you know, and I think he was serious. Who knows what, a, you know, oh, I would yeah. have seen what was just coming I don't everywhere. doubt it. The resentment factor of guys yeah, who, yeah. We, I, we had guys that cooperated that during those conversations, it would come out that they were very resentful that they did time and this person did not do sure, time. Sure. They that, got opportunities that this other person didn't get opportunities. So they're friends with them. They're best friends with them. But there's always a little bit of something there that's like, you know what? He's always had it better than me, easier than yeah. me. And once again, he's going to do it to me again and not this time. And so that's the impetus to, to cooperate. Wow. Although, you know, it's probably a pretty good strategy to put the bug in someone's ear that there's a bunch of people lining up to fuck. Yeah, you. but you know, my, my, you know, there's no bullshitting this. That's what I love about it. Like, what, there's no bullshitting this. Like, they could say that, and if you're somebody who's doesn't understand, you might fall for that. That's why I love watching, you know, these interrogation videos on YouTube. I watch them like constantly. I just love the, I love the 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 back and forth between it, and you yeah. get these fucking junky bank robbers that are, you know, they're like, listen, we already know what happened. He's like, well, since you already know, I'll tell you. Like, you fucking idiot. Like, you know, but this is a, this is what I loved about it was these are guys that are raised on the streets that, you know, know all the tricks in the book, right? They, the masters of manipulation, right? Your, your father being sort of, you know, probably one of the best ever that would sit down and manipulate situations in order to get people to do the things he wanted to do. You can't go in and tell them, you know, we have a bunch of people te- ready to testify. Without, right, you know, right. When, when we flipped, I don't know if you're familiar with when we did the body recoveries for, for actually a lot of the murders that happened during the during the Colombo War out on Eastern Long Island in in in, in Farmingdale, right? So we, we we dug up Cotolo out of site two, and then we had Richie Greaves, and I'm drawing a blank on on the third one out by the out by the train tracks. Um, you know, to get to that point where you're starting with these low level sources that know a little bit about everybody, but nothing that's ever chargeable. To get to the point where you're bringing someone into the woods, that's like. That's yeah. where we buried him. Right there. Right, Let's get right. in the car half my way. That's there's where we buried him. There. Yeah, there's a lot of steps in between, and there's a trust that has to happen between you and that person that they're vetting you as much as you're vetting them mm-hmm. to make sure that they're not falling for a trick, which is, oh, you know, there's someone else ready to testify. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that they know it's serious at that point. It's basically get on the boat, 
or get on the bus or get on the train, whatever metaphor the agent likes to use, because it's leaving the station and right. it's leaving with you or it's leaving without you. And there's three other people that are on it already, and we only have spot for one more person. And it's effective because you could let them know, like, yeah. this is where we're about to head out to Farmingdale. Does that ring a bell? You know, we're about to head out to the train station, you know, over there. We're about that. We we dug up parts of a skull from, uh, uh, God, where was that? A, a auto body shop in Brooklyn, right? When you come back to someone and they say, they're thinking, we moved the body. Uh, and I'm forgetting again the guy's name. And they did move the body. The problem is, is they left a chunk of scalp, scalp uh, with hair on it. And so when you said, yeah, we know you moved the body. You know what you didn't get? A piece of a scalp with his hair, with his DNA. Exactly where that source told us that body was buried. Then they're, then they're like, uh, yeah, let's talk. You know, wow. let's talk. Are, are Do you have any people in in that you know from the life that you're kind of um, afraid of? Some people that have done some things uh, that, you you know, maybe when you see them and you're like, hey, how you doing? You're kind of like, hmm. Huh. <laughs> oh, not, not now. Not now, know. no. No. I mean, listen, I, I got, I'll be honest with you, when I heard, you know, Greg Scarpa was an informant for so long because he was our crew and I was a you know, I mean, I knew Greg well. We we, we did things together, and um, and even Willie Boy Johnson. You know, um, I was Shylock and money with Willie Boy mm. for a long time. You know, I had money on the street with him when I heard he was. You know, but he had told me when we were in MDC, he was behind the glass on the seventh floor, and I was in there, and uh, Gotti was there at that time. Well, they sent word up to me. I don't know if it was Gotti himself. You know, to find out if Willie Boy, if it was true, because I was on the seventh floor, but he was behind the glass. Uh-huh. And so I had held a note up. You know, I said, Willie, you know, what's the deal? And he just turned to me and he said, you got nothing to worry about because, um, you know, we got along well. Um, huh. But I was I was nervous. I mean, you get nervous when you hear these things because, you, you oh, know, you did shit. things with guys. I tell you, just fascinating uh, stuff, Michael. I, thanks so much for uh, coming on the show. You. You got an amazing story. You tell it well. Uh, and and for somebody to go through that life and pop out the other end, uh, not like it ends in the movies, is is pretty unique. And uh, and you're you're very cool to talk to. Thanks so much. Uh, of course, let me let me uh, what you got going on here. Uh, subscribe to his YouTube channel, Michael Franzese. Is it Franzese? Is that how? Because uh, I know this. Francis, 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 yeah, I know. I get Cumia, Cumia, Cumio, <laughs> Diagostino, you know, yeah, Diagostino, Dia- yeah, yeah, our yeah, whole, yeah. our whole lives, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, stories and lessons from a former uh, mobster, um, Michael Francesi on uh, Twitter and Instagram. Uh, it's got a uh, what is that underscore at the end of it on Instagram, and then website michaelfrancesi dot uh, uh, anything else you want to let the people know that you're working on or doing? Yeah, just, well, we got a couple of things. I got a, uh, a TV series that looks like it's going to be, uh, in production shortly. Um, based- Uh-oh, we're losing uh, you. Hold and, on, you, um, might, you might have to say uh, that again. She's going to production Wait. by the end of this. My, Michael, hold on. Yeah. I kind of stuttered, so you might have to say that again. Okay. Tell me when. You're on. <laughs> Good? Yeah. Yeah, I got a TV series that's coming out based upon my life, uh, probably going to production towards the end of the summer. Uh, we also got a stage play that's going to be in 40 venues next year based upon my life, an actual, you know, musical stage play, believe it oh, or not. musical. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> we, just, uh, we just released a, a Michael Francis wine um, that we've released, and uh, we just launched it, and it's doing well. What about a cartoon, and, Mike? Do we have a Michael Franzi's cartoon out? Yet? No, no cartoons yet. Working <laughs> out for the kids. Yeah, some for the kids, you know? The kids. You, know you know, the funny thing is all this stuff is happening at one time, and I always tell people it took me a lifetime to become an overnight success with all of this, you know? Always the way. Just timing in life, yep. things happen. And then the most important thing right now for me, at least I have this new book coming out next month called A Mafia Democracy. Yeah. Um, that, uh, I, you know, I wrote the book, quite honestly, I have seven kids, six grandchildren, and I'm very concerned about the future of this country because regardless of what I was at one time, I love this country yeah. and I want my kids to enjoy what I was able to enjoy. I'm still here. I'm alive. I'm free. And I got a wife and children that I love. So I'm just really concerned about our country. And I, I, our country, our government is acting very Machiavellian. Yeah. And that was our ideology on the street. And I just want to make people aware of it. And, and go out and vote the right people out of office and the good people in office, if we can possibly do that. Yeah, so. we're going through some crazy times uh, as far as uh, 
this country and, and the government and uh, society uh, as a whole is going. It's it's uh, every day. I'm like, I think it can't get any crazier. Yeah. And then, oh my God, no. it gets yeah. it gets crazier. Uh, Michael, again, thanks so much, man. Be well, and uh, hopefully, you know, we'll talk to you soon. Are you ever in New York? Pop in. Uh, we'll go absolutely. to Brooklyn. Yeah, absolutely. Hang Good out, speaking sure. to you, Michael. Take it yeah, easy. I'm gonna tell my brother we hooked up. Absolutely. Please tell him I said hello. I will definitely. All right. Thanks, All right, Michael. Guys. Good luck to you. Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you. There he Bye -bye. goes. Michael. It's crazy. Yeah. No, he's That's crazy uh, stuff. He's legit. Right? Great freaking interview. That's just awesome. With the FBI dude and you. That's just on. weird, man. I like when he's like. Yeah. Oh yeah, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, watch him all the time. Uh, that was yeah. just fucking nuts, dude. Yeah, that was, that was. It's weird having that conversation with no him. No so shit. Many years later, you know. I mean, like, I I doubt that every interview he does goes like that. No, <laughs> I, I don't think no, every interview he does is no that way. Like, you no, know, you don't have an interview. It's a lot somebody. like, hey, so you know Henry Hill and the no. Goodfellas when the guy does the thing, no. and, and it's like no. So yeah. when I was Tape uh, seven, your dad said working with your brother <laughs> to testify. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like, holy fuck. <laughs> he, he knew right away you were the real deal, right? Oh, yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. Like, you can't fake that. Like, oh, no, uh, no, no. He's on Which the phone like, with his brother right now going, wait uh, a minute. What the like, fuck? Vinny? Yeah, I know Vinny. This cool me a blindside yeah, with fuck. this fucking fed. <laughs> What's this compound media? <laughs> it's a burn fun. that place down. It's a total it's a front. front. They're fed boys, all of them. <laughs> no, Vinny. Jesus Christ. Thanks funny. so much. Yeah. That was, uh, and again, this just worked out I very I oddly. Can't. I literally got a text yeah. from you. You said you were going to be in the city, and you probably wanted to pop in and talk about whatever's been going on yeah. uh, legally in the news, yeah. the shooting that happened yeah. in Brooklyn. And then I go, oh, Michael Francis is coming on the show today. He's like, get the fuck yeah. out of here. He's trying to get it set up on yeah, your show love, at Governor's. I would love to talk to him uh, outside of this. And it was oh, it yeah, just came yeah. up in conversation just randomly last week with somebody else who watches Mike's channel a lot. And now you can just get it. He'll come on. Yeah, the I'll Governor's reach out to him. Thing. I reach in out to him because it's just weird. Somebody brought that to my attention. I said, yeah. you know, that would be a cool conversation. And then a week later, I'm in the city visiting some old bureau friends. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm like, the timing's going to work out perfect. I'll stop by for the show. And then you're like, Michael's it? on. And I'm like, that's just so weird. It isn't, isn't it fucking weird? It's so strange. No, that was, uh, I got to say, uh, that was some compelling shit right there. Yeah. <laughs> no, I could have talked to right. him for hours. Oh, yeah. Anytime yeah. I bump into somebody who was in that life and – this this does happen, believe it. I live on Long Island. This does happen. Yeah. This isn't like I don't, you know, it's not like that life is done and then it never crosses. Every right. couple of months I bump into somebody. And again, because this is years later. One, you need another? Uh, yeah, I'll take one. I'll take two more. Why not? I always have these conversations. And what I've realized is what you've, what you've hit on, which is that the more that time that goes by, like when I last saw Michael, it was at his father's trial. His uh -huh. brother was testifying against him. I was at the government's table. Michael was standing behind, behind his father. The, the way the tables were aligned was weird. And, you know, Michael could have burned a hole through everybody on the government oh, side, hatred. and his brother, and the hatred. Sure, understandable, personal, right? Per very personal, and 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 he's sitting there to back up his dad. His mother was there. In fact, one of the days in court, his mom started yelling at Sonny and like wheeled. He was in a wheelchair at the time. Like wheeled him into the women's room bathroom. Like it, the marshals oh. got involved. They banned her from the building. Like I wanted to ask wow. him about. The, oh, it was shit. a picture behind where you check in of his wife saying she's not allowed on the building. A after Holy that. fuck! It I was a whole thing. So it was very, very. Thank you. It was very, very tense. It will be. And now here it is. I don't know how many years later, and you don't know if people. But most of the guys that I've talked to. Um, not on camera, of course, but when it's happened at like bars and stuff, and I'm like, I know you, and they're like, yeah. I know you too, and then we go into it, and I give them what I, my perspective was, how it happened, and they give me theirs. It's usually a really interesting conversation because yeah, it's yeah. not about who is right or wrong anymore. It was like, wow, so I never knew. And what is it? It probably ends up in some middle ground, yeah. maybe not factually, but emotionally. Yeah, it well, there's credibility the because what I've had a lot of times happen is someone will tell me, oh, well, that's because this person, like I actually do believe there's there's some credence to that about his father in the bank robbery case. That was that was known even within the bureau. That, right. I mean, it was before my time and it's not to shit on anyone else's case, but when I do remember looking into it back then, I was kind of like, oh shit. like shaky. Yeah, shaky. And, and that shit does happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like it doesn't happen, but to his point yeah, later on. Get the guy. <laughs> yeah, but to his point later on, when, when Sonny's blaming the entire unraveling of his family and his life on that. It's like, Dad, you're on tape 
confessing made to a great dozens point. of murders. You're not a fucking no, surgeon. You're not a you're surgeon. Not a lawyer going, I was framed. No. You know, you're not going to get anyone to defend your cause when you're saying this not one Dr. crime. Dr. Richard Kimball. Yeah, Dr. <laughs> yeah. The one armed man <laughs> right, right, was, right. was the underboss of the Columbo family the entire time. <laughs> yeah, that's, not, yeah. that's not true. But usually when I talk to these people, they get, especially when you start having people having kids, that's why I asked about that, which is mm. you could sit there and tell Huge me all you change. want that your father said to you, don't ever become law enforcement FBI agent. I get that because parents like to have their children emulate them. I remember going on arrest of wise guys. very funny, by the way. Yeah. And, and like, not only funny, but profound yeah. that you went, yeah, my parents, first generation. Right. I, don't be in the me, mafia. Don't be in the mafia. Right. Don't be a fucking criminal <laughs> because you, you're here representing Italians. Yeah, yeah. And that culture is something, we're, that part of our culture is something we're trying to leave behind, which again, right. going to his whole problem, I'm very curious about his book and all that, about the destruction of this country. And all oh, I'll things. read that. It all comes to the gone, family. Right. Yeah. It all comes from the family. All these problems we see with crime, it all starts with family saying, don't, you, to say, to say there's a big gap between being a cop and just a generally following the rules. You don't have to want to be a cop. I don't, I actually wouldn't even want my kids to become cops right. at this point. But you but generally yeah, follow the rules. Yeah, but going into the Columbo family is a far <laughs> extreme on the other side. Don't become a cop. All right, I'll be. Yeah, well, uh, then I'll be one of the heads of the. Fucking yeah, I'll be on the administration <laughs> level of the Colombo family. Is that what you meant? No, yeah, no, no. Yeah, something yeah. in between. How about like a garbage man? Like maybe something in between. Right, right. And so that's the thing. Uh, like he didn't good. stand the chance any more than a gangbanger growing up in that community yeah, who's told, yeah. "Don't trust the cops. This is the way of life. This is what you leave." So it all goes back to the family. If that's your father. If that's my father, I'm the guy on that call going, exactly. I ended up in jail for 20 years. You're gonna, I know it. Exactly. It, it, it's That's what, and it's weird. I was going to ask a question that you ended up just mm -hmm. answering for me when you asked mm -hmm. him a question. And it was about his childhood. Did he ever have any inkling or aspirations to be anything else and Sorry. really try to pursue it? Like, I want to be a fucking, I want to make furniture. Yeah. I want, whatever yeah. it is. Did he ever think that? And then instantly it just went, no, no. this is my life. That, and, and like when, that's why I asked him how long, uh, how young was he when he, he found out everything? learned about it. Because are you yeah. so young that he it's before young. you even have these. He didn't say it, but I remember from John that if I remember correctly, it was around 16 when Michael and John, I forget which one now, was 16 when they first learned and they were like, dad's in the mafia? Uh -huh. Which isn't young. But no, But certainly no, isn't not. like, oh, I was 42 and I was married and right, it's not right. a secret life. And at that point- <laughs> Like Breaking Bad, dad, what's yeah. going on here? <laughs> I, dad, I need to talk to you. Where's Hank? Where did Hank go? I totally forgot about his son and, uh, and figuring it all out. Oh, what a yeah. dummy he oh. was. Yeah, yeah but that, but that's just like... fucking- uh, it's an amazing fun. story. Um, um, like everyone's stunned how those guys don't get whacked, you know? Yeah. How do you not get whacked? And he's, he's, he brought it up. It's like so, it, it, it's so undramatic where it's like, yeah, they just didn't yeah, really they care. Did. They, they're, they're all John, they're concerned. John's out of the program. John was in for a long time. The guy I was talking about who testified and or made tape against made 250 tapes, a ton of which his dad was on, and and uh, he's out of the program. So the, it's not that it, it the th the threat is just not what it was anymore. Like right. the bureau does a good enough job of getting these convictions um, and keeping these people safe long enough. Eighty percent of the people sign out of the witness security program. It's just, just not it's amazing. not workable. Eighty yeah. percent. You think they're there forever? No, it's not workable because you know, there's always someone watching them. No, uh, it's not. It's just like too that. restrictive. They they they. A lot of these people are bright. Um, that's one of the things about it. You know, I like to think about Italians is a lot of them actually have. I mean, look at Michael, right? He's kind of turned this into a business, right? Like, un fucking right believable, now, if his right? Dad was, I got my wine, I got yes. a cartoon. If his dad was fucking Bezos, right? Jeff Bezos, he would be like, and then I created this and I created that. Right, like, right. He, he, he's someone who was obviously an intelligent, creative guy and had a business sense, but then he has a dad saying, let's use that business sense to do a gas scam. Yeah, right? yeah. But he's someone who probably could have made millions legitimately. Legitimately. He had a different influence. And that goes, all goes back to, and he's got charisma, so absolutely. He, he could obviously 
network and talk. Absolutely. Yeah, could have been. Could have been. Whatever. There's a parallel universe where he's a CEO of a company. <laughs> right, right. And he's like, oh, you know, my dad died when I was three and oh. I didn't know him. And then I went into business. And, and, like, and you're on a show yeah, and, and I'm not like going, well, oh, my father, you know, got me into the life. And- yeah. <laughs> what choice did I have? You know? <laughs> But believe me, that's the temptation because, like, you know, when, when my parents came here, that was what they were surrounded by in Brooklyn. Right, was, yeah. Wise guys owned everything. I mean, they were they were in coal, coal, uh, coal and ice delivery, which the mob Oh, owned. right, yeah. Um, it, it, oh, there were certain industries where it was exclusive. exclusive. Everyone. It doesn't matter. You never got a not my Cement. Yeah. The concrete yes. business in the yeah. 70s and 80s yeah. in New York City was 100% mob. Right. And th- there was no other way around it. So yeah, there were yeah, industries, was, and that. So I think just having a a parent there, you know, to say to you, that's not the life for us. Right, wrong, you know. Yeah. And then I just I hated it. Like I, I remember kids joked around about us being in the mafia when we were kids. And so you either were going to yeah. go one way or the other. You were going to indulge that and be like every guy I went to high school with was like we're in construction. You know, like everyone who pretended. Right. Most of them pretended. There was a few people who had legit. Well, you know, my uncle. Well, hey, good. Hey, even hey, in law school, we had that. Nothing. Yeah. His even uncle's um, just a douchebag. Yeah. And like. <laughs> Your uncle's a snitch. It was, <laughs> it was a degenerate gambler who snitched yeah. on three people. And you know what's crazy now? Uh oh, what? What's that? These dudes have their own YouTube yes. shows. They Sammy have the YouTube Bull. Shows. Sammy the Bull has, I think, a YouTube channel. Yeah. So Sammy, if Sammy's okay, Michael's okay. If Michael, oh my right, God, okay. Sammy so, rats so, out the biggest yeah. fucking most, you know, one of the most notorious gangsters. Yeah, notorious, and he's. He's that's still the thing. alive. Like, that's why I look at Sonny, and it's not – There's I don't know what the right word for is. And this was Esther in that documentary. I don't know if the word's respect. It's just more of a – it's not an admiration. It's a combination of fascination that yes. you have a guy that's so committed. It is fascinating. He's wrong in his commitment. He chose – the bottom line is he chose La Cosa Nostra over his biological family. And that's what Michael was getting at in the end, that your decisions destroyed this family because he had a good family. He said it. He and, and destroyed. He and said. John, Sonny doesn't – agree to that because I think the pain of acknowledging that you did that is just too much to too bear. Much. You've committed 85 at that point, when maybe when I was having that conversation. Sonny died at like 103. Yeah. So let's assume he had that conversation with him. Um, no, he said it was after the conviction. So he's probably upper 80s at that point. What are you going to do? You're going to tell yourself that your life was the wrong choice. Your entire you're, you're committed. Life. You're all in. You might as well ride it to the grave and say, you're nope, I didn't do that. I was say. set up. You're never going to say that. Right. But somebody who was probably a little bit more younger, who would have had those thoughts, would have probably realized this is destroying my family. And maybe, as he did, right? I got to get away from this. Like, this is not going to, the movie does never ends. Every organized crime movie but never ends well. he didn't say that when in the money was rolling. No, in, of course and not. Everything was going well. Just think about it. When you're young, Especially when you're male and yep. you're young oh, and you're getting women and, and you're getting money, yes. you're invincible. You're yep. invincible. Expecting a person that way to be like, I don't know if this is going to really. this is the wrong no. thing for the long no. term. You're, he's lost Maybe at that when point. when I have kids and I'm an older man, no. I look back and say, so I'm going to stop right now. No. You're yep. literally a whore's on your face. Yeah. Snorting <laughs> coke off of tits. Yeah. It's just fucking. Every decision never. was the right one. <laughs> it's the yeah. perfect decision. 